You know, I kept the other can. Which other can? You get we brought two yesterday, and I kept the other one. Ah, uh -huh. did you? So I was actually thinking about having that before the. It's nine in the morning, and you're talking about having a little sneaky can of gin. It could be the perfect time for that somewhere on this planet. Here in Margate, <laughs> I think it's the perfect time for it. I'm just settling for a coffee, but cheers. Cheers. Welcome back to Radio Juxtapose. My name's Doug Gillen, and on today's episode, I'm live in conversation with the artist Hera. Jasmine Siddiqui is a German-Pakistani artist from Frankfurt, more commonly recognized by her moniker Hera. Named after the Greek queen of the gods, her adopted pseudonym created a protective armor, shielding the young, shy illustrator and graffiti artist from the harsh realities of life in the street art limelight. Along with fellow German artist Aku, they formed the creative partnership Heraku. Together, they spent two decades creating murals, exhibitions and installations across the globe. Hera's loose, expressive approach to mark making perfectly contrasted the tight methodology of Aku's photorealistic and detailed portraiture. At the heart of their work lies tales and fables old and new. Each work of art a reflective story of the physical or mental place they happen to find themselves at the time. With Akut's family life taking priority in recent years, the duo's globe trotting has somewhat died down, freeing Hera to further carve out her own independent identity as an artist. Today, we find ourselves in the British coastal town of Margate, participating in the Ocean Conservation and Awareness mural project Rise Up Residency. Fronted by locally based artist Louis Masai, the Rise Up Residency has partnered 17 artists with various social and ecological outreach projects and brands using art to generate ocean literacy in the seaside town. As one of the participating artists in the project, I managed to grab Hera one morning for a chat before she head out to finish off her piece. We'll put links to the project and Hera herself in the episode show notes, but that right now is it from me. Enjoy the episode. So this is your your first time in Margate? Yes. How, how are you enjoying the experience so far? What brings you down here? It's uh, Luis Masai's invitation, to be honest. And he could have invited me to another place in the world and I would have still come. But, you know, Margate, when I looked it up on the map, it just looked like the perfect place to breathe fresh air for a minute. Because I've just been in New York, so... This is the, the opposite of that kind of air, and it's beautiful. Do you need that kind of balance between, because you're a city girl by heart. Yes. So do you need that kind of like that escape to the, the country, as it were? I wouldn't get bored anywhere in the world. I think I always see something um, I could work on. But this view and um, just, just a view, not being obstructed by architecture and also the huge body of water that you have right here i think it's called the ocean it's humbling you know it just it's good for the ego to see there are like bigger things and also maybe bigger problems than yours yeah so tell me about the the, the project itself and how you've kind of uh tackled this this concept the term for this project i think it's it's that's right it's a project it's not a street art festival at all um, it's artivism, if anything. So we we bridge art and activism, and with the focus on the ocean and ocean literacy, teaching or just raising awareness about what's um, happening and going on right in front of our eyes, basically. But then again, we're just as humans so um, so blind, so 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 uh, ignorant. So what was the brief for you then? Because I know that if you talk about artivism, there has to be some kind of, you know, some kind of collective goal behind that. So what was that for you? Luis is, his 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 artivism um, is focused on environmental issues. While I do a lot of workshops, I work on the humanitarian sector of things, I'd say. I try to engage as many kids that walked by my mural as possible and that's I knew where it was going to be placed and I I knew that I was gonna talk to children in the neighborhood 
about this project and then that really was what what got me to this to sketch this this thing out where I'm showing a, a seal and mermaids and a very playful children's book situation um, but then again with a, an important message so it's all wrapped up in a language that aims to be understood by, by kids. What do you think bringing those children into the project then adds to it? And it might seem like a kind of dumb question, but I think it's no, also it, no, important. No, it's one. absolutely... I don't want, just want to go around the world um, writing my name. This is why I separated from um, doing graffiti and I went into street art because I wanted to be a voice to other people's issues. I do that and then I also always add writing, you know, and I always try to have that in the language, in the actual language that's spoken in that area. So it's a local tongue. All of this I do because I want to be understood by our next generations or whoever local is going to be a neighbor to my work. And um, inviting the children um, also, I mean, we did have some teenagers and uh, and a mom who got active. So it's, we'll call it a loose use of the word children then. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the inner children. Um, uh, so, but for talking, um, you know, for, for giving them the brush or the, the, the roll or whatever tool, spray can, it makes them part of this. It's, an, uh, it's a way to empower people to make them realize, hey, I got permission to do this. So uh, apparently my hand is important in this. And if you tell somebody they are important, that's so good for the actual project because then every step and every decision they make, it feels more important to them. So if we want trash off the ground and ultimately out of the ocean, they just, their, their self-esteem, you know, grew um, by miles by having them be a part of something so visible. When you get asked to do a project like this, what's the first stage in that process for you then in trying to decide what that final wall might look like? And does that change per location to location? Yeah, I usually do not sketch anything before I arrive on site because it, it's just a different thing. You need to feel... There's a vibe to every location. There's color schemes. And I want to engage with them on site um, plus also talk to whoever, whoever's around because I am I have the luxury of just leaving again <laughs> but they, they have to see my my work and so I want them to engage and every step so for this wall it was um, it was probably more Louis that I trusted him because he's not just any curator he's an artist so when when artists invite, other artists, uh, they 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 just they know what we need more than others, you know, and and they don't just see us as um, the circus horses performing, but they actually want to make us feel comfortable. I do the same when I curate. I just really try to um, have this a good experience for both sides. So I don't just ask an artist and just like Lewis did with me, come and and you know and work and then fuck off you know it's gonna we uh he made this he created this as a really interesting experience for me to take home with so it's give and take so that's what i had here and usually with every project i choose i choose never no, seriously never because of money never i could do without commercial projects in in general i know my life is my lifetime is limited so i want to make it as full of adventures and experiences as possible. And that's why I just want a wide variety and I want to spread good messages. Is there a difference for you then when you approach, because you, you know, you've literally just said that you came from New York, you know, yeah. you grew up, you were from Frankfurt, but you spent a lot of time in Berlin. You know, these are, these are really, really visually stimulated cities, but then you come to a town like Margate, which is almost void of any kind of color and kind of free radical expression that street art kind of offers you, does it change how you approach a place? The interesting thing um, is that I do not agree with you that it's void of stimulus because 
I, I, visual. I, 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 I mean, I go, okay, okay, yeah, let me back. William Turner that. might have disagreed with you as well, you know? I mean, void of, let's just fucking make it easy. There's no street art here. Yeah. There's no graffiti here. And you come in, is there a difference in how you approach a place like that? No, no, no. There's no, I mean, I don't need to have um, open doors, basically, for my kind of work because I don't mind to you know, run down some doors. So I've worked in the Middle East where they were, you know, they didn't know what we were even doing and why we would waste our time and resources on painting for other people. Why we could just paint our house pretty, you know, our own house. So they, it was, it was interesting. You know, I did that in Jordan. In Nepal, when I was painting in Kathmandu, <laughs> people thought I was a, a politician putting up my, my slogans for my party. And they would just totally not understand the concept of, just doing it for fun, you know, because it looked like work and it was, it came with a risk sort of, you know, and then, um, yeah, so I really don't mind being the first uh, one in a place to introduce this kind of language. So for you then, in that vein, what does this kind of expression, what does it leave a town or a space? All right, so I talked to Louis a lot uh, we talked about the word legacy, and that sounds really big. But I, I always wanted to be a teacher when I was little because teachers were the most impressive people I knew. You know, they knew so much. I loved knowledge. And when I was a little kid, I was always like, oh, I want to be a teacher too. You know, I want to leave some idea in someone else's head. And that's basically what I'm doing now without actually being employed by a school. So um, I can, I don't have to run my thoughts by a system. I cannot just, you know, just plant them in other people's heads um, as I please, <laughs> which is crazy, like, fucking it looks luxurious. So whatever, whatever anyone takes away from watching me working is already good and is already uh, something beautiful because it's pro it's 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 just um well it's just positive you know it's positivity they see they also see a woman painting you know they they see a woman maneuvering a a machine that they usually see construction workers like male construction workers use so so then they they most of them think well that could, can't be so hard then <laughs> you know so it's kind of like this but it's fine and then we have all these um uh, children who say um wait can i join and then i'll be like yeah and they're like no way really and it's like yeah see if you ask nicely you you might get a positive answer so the whole thing is positivity positivity engaging other people um being nice um also, I blow their minds when I tell them I'm German, you know, I'm, I don't, I might not get your joke because we're very serious people. So I'm German. T and then they were like, well, you're German. If you're German, then I'm, I don't know. Like, <laughs> so, um, it's everything I hope they got from seeing me work is that even though it feels like shit sometimes, but I think life can be good and we should just, um, spread that message first and foremost because if we want to make any positive changes environmental uh, or, or social we need a lot of energy and i draw that from good vibes it was funny because we were standing there yesterday and, and this is something that happened to me like maybe eight years ago or something like that. we were standing there i'm standing there clean head to toe completely clean holding a camera you're standing there covered in spray paint head to toe, holding a can of spray paint. And a guy comes up and says, "Is th to me, is this your work? And it was like, what do you think, man? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the person standing right there covered in paint. And that's still happening in 2022. Do people still seem surprised to see a woman in the street painting? It doesn't stop, but it's a generational thing. It was necessary for me to come so he would learn that. So <laughs> I would just say that. In 20 years that you've been doing this or, or more, yeah. um, how, how, how much have you seen that shift in, you know, we're talking about females out in the street right. doing this. How much have you seen that shift move from something that was quite, you know, quite isolated, quite rare to closer to what the golden utopia might look like? 
I am so excited because I, I saw so much change and really it just that's why I love street art because it's um it's first of all it's the first global art movement ever because because of social media and because of us taking things in our own hands so we could form this at the same time all over the globe and then uh, that created such a big network so that's why I think it was easier for marginalized groups in this to break usual systems because of networking as when I started I usually was surrounded by male artists the opportunity that through through media um, um, that we had was once we found another female artist or, or someone we really liked we could easily reach out and so that's a, a big plus and that really grew into I don't want to say now street art is 50-50, but maybe it is. It kind of feels like we've accomplished as me as um, a female in this. When I look around now, I, I see so many really beautiful murals, big productions done by females. Of course, not they're there and they do great stuff. But not everyone is represented in galleries yet or represented equally um, in when you look at uh you know the worth of work so that's that's still you know that's still a little bit of a an you know that's still not equal maybe it doesn't have to be i don't know because it's really hard i'm not saying it doesn't have to be equal equally between the genders but not it's not you know it's hard it's a hard topic but someone who just came into the game and's been doing this for 2 years cannot expect to be you know um making the same amount of money for their canvases as someone who's been doing this for 20 years that's kind of what i mean so of course women came in a little later but they came in very strong and um i'm just so happy to be a witness of this why do you think there was historically this separation from women in the gallery space uh that is god there's a lot of way smarter people than me did studies on this and um it's just been a, a male industry, and uh, it was <laughs> it's a, it was a club. It was a club, so I can't really really get into this now. But I um, I didn't even notice until I became a curator myself, where I had to look at where I had to look at um, different price systems, and then I started questioning things. But I also noticed that when you invite a female, for example, real quick, I'm I'm curating. We got time. Okay, I'm curating uh, a really nice project. That's an ongoing project. It will continue for two more years uh, in the south of Germany. It's in a city called Bayreuth, and the project is it's a hotel. It's uh, it, it tries to be as sustainable as possible. It's um, in connection of the Meisel Brewery. So when they built the hotel. They use, for example, they use um, the heat that's created while brewing for heating the hotel rooms. And there are all sorts of little little tiny things that when they asked if I wanted to be involved, I said, wow, this is a really, really awesome project to support. And then they said, hey, could you be the curator of this? And um, I, again, I was so excited because this city is known for only one thing, and that's Wagner music and Wagner was a favorite um, composer. Uh, his he, he made, his music was uh, Hitler's favorite tunes, and um, I don't know. I just feel like it's it's time to <laughs> maybe <laughs> shift that narrative exactly a little bit, renew the image of that city, and give um, it's something that was so exclusive for so long you know they build a whole opera house for Wagner uh, Nazi money did that and so let's make it inclusive and let's get international artists here to yeah to start a new chapter how's the response been there to, to seeing this because it's again it kind of comes down to that idea of you go to big you know urban developed areas like Berlin and like New York and then you go to a place that's known for you know Hitler's favorite music yeah. how, how do they take to this kind of creativity but that's the thing you just have to you have to be bold and introduce it but in a in a in a nice and friendly manner and not you know hit them over the head with 
you know, painting a huge dick or something. It's just like painting maybe a small dick. <laughs> you know? It's just kind of, it's just be not, just be more, as again, inclusive and in, invite people, um, give them something that's legible at first, then give them something that may ra raise questions. It's just, that's a part of curation though, you know? So I, what I did was I invited, um, now we've had uh, close to 70 artists from more than 30 nations paint there and bring their energy to the table. And we have, uh, we, we ended up having a um, higher percentage of uh, female artists there. And they brought their children to work if they want, when they wanted to. They brought their husbands to watch the children. <laughs> and same with a male artist. Uh, Akut painted there and he brought his kid and his wife. So it's a new way of looking at this now that there is so much diversity um, we also want to accommodate, I think we should accommodate to diverse um, lifestyles and not go by the old systems, the gallery systems, then the graffiti system. It's like, you know, you could only paint as a woman when you were accompanied by your boyfriend or something. So that's changing and it's it's beautiful to watch how it's changing and it's just, it needs new problem solving. Um, what what interested you about doing curation then? Was this a chance for you to flex something that you had been sat with for a while? But first of all, it's uh, I didn't ask to be in it, but I was asked because that's that's with the hotel situation. I said, wait, why can't you do it? You know people. I was like, yeah, I do, but I I've never done that before. And they said, well, we've never built a hotel, so um, that was kind of this thing. So I really loved how. There was no big pressure on me, um, and it was team effort. And then I was really lucky when I painted uh, for Viva Con Agua in Uganda, in Kampala, I, ha I met a, an awesome person, Anna Lafrenz, who's a project manager. So um, I'm doing this with her in a duo situation, and I'm really, you know, I've worked in a duo situation for 16 years, so I love teamwork. I'm super happy to be the good cop in a good cop, bad cop scenario. For me, it was a new adventure, first of all. And then I started realizing how important it is because just what Louis is doing in Margate, I don't want to just use and utilize these painters, these artists. And that happens a lot. I've seen it. I have, I've, I've felt like that before, that I was just, you know, the, the, the photo op somewhere and I felt like this a lot actually with some curators um, also some gallery owners and people I, I broke uh, contact with because I I felt I don't I mean abuse is a really big word but I, there was a point when I was so low I just thought I'm just producing no one cares about my well-being really they actually yeah you know, this ugh, the suffering artist is It doesn't have to be like this. So when when I invite somebody and I got the chance to do that uh, in Hamburg at St. Pauli uh, Millantor Gallery, that's a, you know the, the, a really big charity, or uh, not charity, well, it's um, another artivism project. Mm -hmm. It's uh, for um, building wells in um, uh, rural regions of the world. And so uh, through art, we collected money. And I did curation at the Millinger Gallery in Hamburg in July. And um, every and then another project in New York where I got uh, the curation job. And with each one, I want it to be, it to be a win-win situation. So for public and whoever sees this art, but also for the artists to go home with something new, something valuable and paid. <laughs> the big one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Because as I said before, I don't love, I really, really, it's really hard for any brand to get me to do commercial jobs because I'm just not excited about it. I'm so picky with that. So go on then. Why? Uh, what is it that is it? What do you look for then when you are doing a commercial job? What will be yeah. the thing that takes you over the line and says, actually, I'm interested in this? Yeah. So it's usually it's um, working for NGOs. So it is commercial in the way that there is a brand like the uh, uh, WWF Germany or UNICEF Germany. Again, I'm saying Germany because it's not I 
don't really want to work for UNICEF Global or UNICEF USA. I really want to work with the smaller scale um, organizations because they're more transparent. And um, I, uh, with Viva Con Aqua, yes, they do sell water, but they're also they're also uh, an organization that does good. So it's just you know, it, there needs to be a balance and a reason and. Um, the hotel, uh, as I said before, that is in connection with a brewery, but <laughs> I'm not selling. I'm not selling beer now. You know, I'm selling the. Uh, I'm, I'm part of selling the um, bringing culture to a place where the culture they have there is a little questionable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So if there's a, a brand, obviously there need to be funding for anything, but. Their intention needs to come from a good place and not from greed. You're listening to Radio Juxtapose in conversation with the German artist and storyteller Hera. This episode has been recorded in the town of Margate and could only have been made possible thanks to the Rise Up Residency Initiative, who are championing ocean literacy through art. Coming up in the second half, we talk art and mental health as we go right back to the early years Let's get back into it right now. We're talking about these international projects, and I use that word a lot, but this is these are really international projects we're talking. When you were sitting riding a train in Frankfurt looking at graffiti, did you ever think that this would be the, the stepping stone to take you up to, to doing these kind of projects? Was this ever a thought that would go through your head? No. I was a very, very fragile child, so... This is real deep talk now, so um, I think I knew about violence and about hurt and uh, and about such a thing as suicide from a very early stage because in it, it happened uh, in you know around me <laughs> and I don't even think I would be forty forty one at some point. It's just kind of weird, but I had this feeling. I've always felt like everything is so fragile. Uh, my depression started uh, materializing really early in my life and I've been, you know, I'm, I'm being treated for it, but also I'm so still aware that there's something that is not super stable. So everything is a bonus, you know, everything is just great. And I don't make a, f- I don't have a three-year plan, a five-year plan or anything. I really go step by step and every step is a plus because I didn't even think I would, you know, be this, uh, be this <laughs> right now. So it's funny you talk about you know depression, mental health, and being an artist is counterintuitive almost because the art, the process of creating something is generally like you know it's where people would feel that that was an outlet, but when that outlet becomes your source of income and your stability was this ever a conflict you know this thing that was supposed to give you the joy and the release and actually you need to be the cow you know producing milk yeah 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 the, uh, and it was it was another artist um oh, let me think who was it but there was some someone who said they milk the cow until it bleeds and God, that's a horrible image. That is such a horrid image. Um, but I think it was really good for me to also realize, well, there's there's limited resources everywhere and also within. I had to retrace, like, why did I ever start painting? Why did I do this? And I, I think every child that chooses a hobby does it for um, applause or for you know, to to get positive feedback from their parents and their surroundings. With me, um, I couldn't catch a ball if I wanted to, so (laughs) sports wasn't an option. But um, it made my my parents really happy to know that I was safe and just drawing away. So I just continued pleasing people with what I was doing. It didn't come from me doing art, didn't really come from me wanting to do art. It may have. But just for a second, but then it came from me wanting to please people. So I had to, I had to break away from that when I was 18 
and stop doing the nice stuff. And that's actually when I discovered graffiti. So that was my, my, I didn't even have art and graffiti on the same page. For me, art was the fine art stuff that everyone was like, oh, that's so pretty. Can you do that for me? Too? Can you do this bouquet and my dog? And, you know, I don't know. I'm nothing against portraits of dogs. I love dogs. I have one myself. Even even here, we were standing on the lift the <laughs> other day and the guy pulls up and says, can you paint my dog? Yes, it's, it's great. I love that. But to, to do commission work, I had to break free. And that's when I found the, the, the spray can um, and in my hand, it just made so much sense. And I found graffiti where I was like, oh, I don't have to please people. I can actually really do what I want. And then after some years doing that and, and then having people want me to do that, I had to break free from that again and be like, you know what? Again, this started to become something where I'm pleasing someone. Not doing that. So you have to remind yourself every once in a while that health <clears throat> and, and you have to come before any audience. Was this for you just a total graffiti in its early days? Was that just a rebellion away from who you had seen yourself becoming? Definitely even giving myself a name, choosing a name for myself. That was already so obviously breaking away from from me being the nice girl and being Jasmine. Yeah, and being Jasmine. I mean, can you believe how small it feels to be Jasmine? Because jasmine is this tiny flower that's so accommodating, you know, it's just, it's it's small, it's not very loud, and it's not like a rose or something really pretty and big or lily, that's just, but anyway, so jasmine also in, in the German pronunciation is jasmine, which is not, it's just jasmine, it's so dull, <laughs> jasmine, and it's just not exciting. So giving myself a new name was like rebirth, I'm like, I'm Hera. You know, it's just, I'm a vicious goddess. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> With a cough. I love that. Uh, and then how quickly was it for you until you kind of, I don't want to say got bored of graffiti, but graffiti didn't fulfill the thing that you now are known for? Yeah. It might have been... Uh, it might have been a great way, but my legs just wouldn't run fast enough. So if I had just been a little bit more athletic, I could have probably pulled a really great work on the street illegally. Just didn't work with my constitution. <laughs> so I tried. I did try. Um, and then I realized my uh, my interactions with people on walls are what what creates the whole artwork so that's when i when i went to legal graffiti halls in germany and then just painted by myself and then someone would come by and we'd start a, a, a dialogue about life or whatever and that really that really put the um the spice into my work and then i'd I loved that so much. I loved the interaction. So it was already sort of talking to the wall and whatever was, was on the wall and the, the whole surrounding. And then you have another one join the conversation, someone you don't know. And um, that's the beauty. And that's what makes it more than just painting. It really makes it a whole um, experience. So that's also why for a long time I didn't even bother to take... Um, uh, photos or document my actual painting because it was more it was a memory that I took home and um, words someone put in my head and even though I might not be able to know again you know point out who inspired me but it was a lot of situations and I was in Sarajevo and I painted something on a wall that was illegal but it was in daylight so it was it was just I painted a ballerina massaging her feet because I was walking so far to the location from painting at this festival that my feet really hurt and I painted this ballerina and then this old lady came by and she carried two bags and um, I thought she was gonna say hey what are you doing but she put down the bags and she came up with two thumbs up and that was such a beautiful moment and you know stuff like this where you're just somewhere in the world and a bus driver 
uh, who, who's been on this route forever, but he slows down and also, you know, gives you a thumbs up or some little things like this. So this is what graffiti couldn't have provided for me because I would have had to run. <laughs> couldn't wait for the thumbs up. <laughs> so. There's obviously one big aspect of yeah. Hera that we've not talked about. We're talking about this idea of collaboration. We're talking about all these people. But there's, there's the, almost the elephant in the room of Hera's collaborative endeavors. When did Akut first come into the into the mix? And was it th was it automatically the idea with that of, hey, we need to be working together. Yeah, it was quite literally, uh, we need to be working together because we were <laughs> both invited um, to a festival um, in, in Spain, in Sevilla. And it was Lumid who said, hey, why don't you, Hera, want to work with us on this wall? So he had to be working with me, so he had no choice. But also he was pleased because he had some emotional baggage to get you know rid of I told you I always liked conversations in front of a mural or in front of a wall so that's how it started I didn't even realize his I got his real name wrong I got his legal name wrong um so for a while where did you go I I thought his name was Frank but it's Falk <laughs> so that was uh, yeah but that's just it's, for four years you were <laughs> I, I sent letters to the wrong <laughs> address yeah. too it it started out from just having laughs together and not so much um thinking about each other's styles we just enjoyed our company each other's company and we had a uh, share a really stupid humor um that's like wordplay and it's in 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 german it's called kalawa it's a certain type of super idiotic super maybe you'd call it dad jokes <laughs> you know so <coughs> oh god i'm dying it's something like my lung doesn't want me to talk about this yeah, silly shit. that's frank yeah so it was the uh, human connection uh not the artistic connection that that started Heracut. but really quickly after we first met um we got together for another another um, little project here and there, and it became 16 years. <laughs> That's a pretty serious run, and, and now you guys, you, you, you don't really paint so much anymore together. Do you ever see it kind of coming back? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, because uh, his part is so time-consuming. <laughs> it's just takes forever to paint realistically and I, that's why you know I'm, I'm not bothered I mean I'm not copying his part uh, we we did I for everyone real quick it's me doing the in Heracud it was um basically my proportions and the the storytelling and then we um had him pick parts that he'd really like to get render exactly into and um take his time on take photos as photo references you know find models for certain eyes for certain poses at some point um it was kind of funny he had a he had some nude models in his studio and they twisted and bend in crazy ways because you know because of my sketch <laughs> and then he was like um we're not gonna do that again. <laughs> it's a little weird. I don't want them to twist on it, you know, get naked in my yeah, studio. Yeah. That's much. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> um, so, for example, you know, his uh, the reflections he did on on plastic surfaces or leather, everything that works well um, with reflections. That's amazing, and I'm not even gonna get into that because it's just his specialty. So what I'm doing now on my on my own is more really focused on the the fairy tale, the storytelling stuff. So yes, yeah, there's a, there's a lot he can do he can do once he has time to join me again. What was that feeling like when you were drifting off and maybe not collaborating so much? Were you trying to sort of like go in and do that photorealistic element and fill the void, or were you inherently trying to just make sure you didn't do that? Um, I didn't try to copy his work because it how it was with us he actually you know looked at a, a rough sketch or an idea and then he brought his own ideas of oh this thing could work and so you know now that he's not there um to add that like i i'm not gonna pretend to be a coot and then you know like 
<laughs> like trick the audience. <laughs> yes, exactly. No, 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 no. That's, and I don't have the time because I said, you know, it's, it, it was his specialty and he... Um, with when he worked with his crew, his old crew, McLean, they were already known as you know being the the, the founders of photorealistic um, graffiti b- before he even met me. So there's I just can't do that. Um, again, I, I'm saying you know I, I mentioned real quick uh, if he, he just doesn't have the time because what may um, some people don't know we were not a couple. <laughs> you know we were not husband and wife. Um, doing this for 16 years but you weren't no he had his, his everybody everybody no. says that <laughs> <laughs> no but um we, he had his his own life and family and in the end with um a home with three children and two being in school and then a little one and his wife it was just he has real shit to do and i can do whatever i please you know and so the energies and the the he, the commitment he has for his family that's that takes uh, a front row so that's his decision making so it wasn't that we got into a fight about anything artistic it was really just that i noticed um i want to i want to travel i want to continue traveling and um yeah so once he's sorry i'm not saying anything bad about his kids but kids you know <laughs> once you are okay you can make your own sandwiches. Let daddy come <laughs> and join me on, on traveling the world again. Okay. Do you? I love that. Uh, you want to you call him out by name? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, do you, it's funny because you talk about this. Do, does that, does that lifestyle appeal to you at all? And this is, I, and I almost don't want to ask this question because I'm very hyper aware that I'm asking a woman about the idea of, you know, doing the family thing. But do, does that uh, I already, appeal to you? I already told you my age. I really am not one to go with the, the regular things. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the whole, you can ask me anything. It's totally, it's totally cool because I'm really, I'm an open book. And I was so keen on having children until i was 30 and and that was kind of for me the thing because i did the math and i I thought okay yeah i have the energy now to do this and then yeah and then everything's gonna get harder and the the more i fall in love with my work in my network there the the harder it's gonna be for me to break away from that and then i've never read I have never read or come across a biography of artists' children who loved the fact that their parent was an international artist and traveled so much, or a politician. You know, when you when you read biographies of the kids of someone who was always there for the world, all they remember is, yeah, he missed my birthday. She missed my birthday. She wasn't there for that game or this game. So I knew from for me that I don't want to be that kind of parent. I don't want to be, I don't want to put someone else into the position of having to explain, well, yeah, but she paints really big murals with all these kids and does these workshops, but she just, she's not going to do it for us. You know? And you made peace with that. Oh, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, um, no, I, I'm totally fine. I come from a very realistic place, uh, also about my mental health, and I know where my limits are. So I totally know I, um, it would be delusional to say I can do both. I, I know I couldn't. You know how distracted I get? You know, you've seen me on the wall. If someone brings a puppy. Confirmed. Yes. <laughs> if someone brings a puppy, no matter how high I am on the lift, I'm going to come down and pet the puppy or paint with the kids. So I just couldn't do it. And um, and then I don't want to also totally commit to being a mom and then later be telling them something like, yeah, you know, uh, this was before you were born. And it's just bad. Yeah, this is my career before you were yes, born. And now I'm sat at home with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's really just from actually from a, a loving point for other people that I'm saying, hey, I don't think I would have had the energy, and it's fine. And there are a lot of children. And when I worked um, with Apt Art Awareness and Prevention through Art uh, in the refugee camps. 
damn, there were so many kids that could have been mine. <laughs> so I, I'm, I ever come to be a, a wealthy artist, I want to have my own um, boarding school and then that could, you know, go as an orphanage as well. And so, and maybe also like a shelter for dogs because I really do love dogs. So <laughs> we could get everything on board that I love. Kids and dogs. And Kids is, and dogs. Is this then, was this kind of part of the thinking? And, you know, we talked earlier about your, your curatorial approach and you're talking about this lifestyle being really unforgiving for, uh, for, for a mother looking after children. And, and the idea of being a mother and leaving your children for weeks or months on end is just like, it's just not an option. So is this what you're trying to maybe challenge a little bit with this curatorial approach? Yes, definitely. And thank you for reminding me because that's, that's one thing that I think an artist will understand more than maybe someone from the other part of the art economy um, is that it does take a toll. You know, you decide to do an art project, but then you leave a whole family or whoever um, at home. And also your plants. <laughs> maybe we should think about bringing plants to work. But um, it's... It is tough. And when you go back, it's not like you can go right into folding laundry. It's like you do need to compress. And it does. It uh, takes more time than just the hours painting. So that's why uh, we need to be more understanding of this and then also trying to accommodate that. So when, um, uh, when I, in my projects, in, invite anyone, um, it's always, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I know, you know, it's, yes, there is party, but it's also family, it's, it's with, fam with focus on just making that artist be happy, so it's family accommodating. So that's why if you say, um, hey, I don't feel comfortable traveling on, traveling on my own, I'd like to bring my mom. Yeah, why not? Uh, we had Amara Dios, uh, who lives in Sweden, and she's an artist. We talked to her when she basically just given birth so that was not an option for coming but then we said you know once you're ready to to come and paint at the hotel bring a sitter bring somebody with you uh, who takes care of your child we had um Frau Isa from Austria come with uh, her toddler and uh, her her baby and her husband who would take care of the kids uh, while she was doing her art and then obviously we didn't expect her to be partying with us you know, that's it's we should really see the whole human and and um, that human also does need rest. So the whole idea of, um, yeah, it's going to be endless party. It's just doesn't, it's not sustainable. And I think this is tying in so nicely to this idea of this mental health conversation that seems to be existing in every other industry and every other sector. They have, you know, if you work in corporate, they have systems in place to protect your mental health. Hey, if you're feeling run down, take some time off, do this. When you're a freelance independent creative, like an artist or whatever that might be, you are on your own. So it's really, really important. And I think what you're saying is really important. The, the projects that are setting up have that at the front where it's like, hey, look, we know that this industry has historically been based around openings and parties and all that stuff, but actually we're going to take it in a different direction and we want you to be able to participate if you're not, you know, if you're not the 21 year old party fiend. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, the, it, seriously, it's just as you said, it's just it was that it was, of course, we were young and there was one opening after the next. And when I traveled to a place, you know, there more than once people who picked me up from the airport were like, so is there anything else you need? You know, what's what's your real yeah. writer? <laughs> do you smoke it or do you sniff it? Exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of like, hey, you know, is there anything beyond champagne? You know, do you want others, uh, other things? I was like, yeah, uh, champagne's fine. Um, <laughs> no, but it's just, it was, it was so much um, hedonism, uh, really, and, and that's totally fine um, for a certain time, I think. But then we don't want this art to be like modeling, you know, for a certain age, uh, like for, for a certain age group, because that would be creating really boring content, to be honest. I think it's more exciting to see artists um, work uh, for years and many years 
Uh, just one one quick example of that. Um, Sweat seventy one. I love him so much. I'm gonna see him next week. I'll paint uh, with him in Denmark, and uh, right before his fiftieth birthday, he painted fifty pieces. And he he's his my favorite work from him are chrome throw ups somewhere in the city. Fifty, you know, he's a father of two, and to see him still go and still do all that all that he does is really awesome and it just i don't know i think uh it's great to see artists age I, because it's one of the only careers i think that you actually get better the older you get you get more technical you get you know there's no reason that you shouldn't be a better painter at 60 than when you were 21 probably i mean maybe the messages are um you know, more, maybe they're louder when you start. Uh, mm -hmm. But then again, it's it's just, look at Swoon, you know, how many, how many lives she's had, you know, from pasting up, uh, pasting th little things, and now doing these big productions, going into different media. Um, and uh, she's, for example, she was one of my big inspirations when I started. And I, I remember that I saw a paste up of hers in, in the, like late 90s, early 2000s in Frankfurt. And I loved it. That was before I knew about street art. And I, when I found out it was, uh, it was this woman from the States who'd done it that did something with me. I was like, oh my, my God, this is so amazing. Thank you so much for coming here, taking your time and doing this for the city. And so it was kind of really, it was such a revelation. And I'm glad that she, she took care of her, own mental health she also talks about this a lot and she has this backstory with her family and it's nice uh that we can follow people's journeys like this and but we shouldn't just follow them as spectators and watching them trip <laughs> you know um but actually trying to be um helpful and uh i'm uh, if i can facilitate that as a curator i want to do it and um and and just be helpful and also see if something's not possible don't rush them you know don't rush them don't be a dick and be like but that's the contract mm. no, you know that's not that's not what it's about it's not about contract sorry at the end of the day it's really about a human pouring their souls onto a wall okay so that's why should there be any other writing involved <laughs> you know yes it's funny you use that expression and it couldn't be more fitting for you because you can see almost the graphic designers in this industry now you know the ones that come in and they have a design and a sketch and it is it, it it's it feels almost void of that soul and what you're talking about is even now, 20 years later, I do get the sense that every single wall or every single piece for you, it is this idea of pouring your soul into this and it still retains that notion of actually an artist rather than a designer. Yeah, with the it's, it's good that you bring this up because I'm a sucker for those graphic murals because I just love the optics, especially in places that are really messed up mm -hmm. because they bring this one cleanliness in there and it's that's why those graphic styles work way better in in a, a very urban context in a very messed up city like hamburg mm -hmm. is a great that's just great because you have all the wild tags you have the rotting <laughs> buildings and then you have the super clean cut mural that's a great contrast and I love that. But it, it wouldn't go down so well in a very, you know, like clean mm -hmm. environment because it'd just be another... Uh, another add, adding to the cleanliness. Yes, exactly. So you just have to find the right, the right visuals for the right place, I think. But also you, you, you said they're coming in now, you know, those graphic designers. There have been gra graphic designers uh, early on, but now there are more coming in and... I think we should also be fair and, and allow them to take their time to try out different things because, of course, it's uh, I've been doing this for so long and for a long time I did it without people watching me. But, but now there's a different um, uh, light uh, on everyone's work and that causes anxiety. So I don't want to judge them too harsh because maybe now they're doing it because it's an easy tool. You do a doodle grid. 
you, or a projector or whatever. So you do whatever makes you comfortable then. But maybe over time they'll figure out, hey, um, there are different ways to approach it. So I just want to give them some time. Maybe they'll totally break, break free from it. Maybe not. And I've done some collaborations, uh, very, very awesome collaborations with... Um, just recently with uh, Moon, uh, she's a graphic designer from Mexico. And that contrast, my messy style and her really graphic style, it was so much fun to do that. I'm a fan of all of those methods, you know, just, yeah. But maybe if, if it becomes annoying for them to do it, they should just stop it. It's funny because... Now more than ever, you mentioned doodle grids and projectors, and we see those those techniques and approaches so commonly now. But even now, you just approach that wall with a fucking a little roller at the end of a big pole, and you are bang, you are mark making, and it's so expressive. Do you ever see yourself uh, reducing, pulling that back, and bringing out projectors and doodle grids? Definitely not. The doodle grid for me, I. Even though I'm saying I, I love the styles, I love the outcome, I love the graphic look of it, but there's something about using so much paint and that's never just goes away. You know what I mean? It's because I started out with almost nothing and I started out with being able to afford one can of black and then the rest of my palette came from uh, buckets I found on the, the, the roadside when people remodeled their houses. So I just took that into my car, watered it down. So that was that was the color scheme, you know. So didn't really have the, the, the money to go into an art supply store. I mean, that's the whole thing why I started painting walls because I didn't have a studio or the money to buy huge canvases. And um, for for me, it's about resources. And then when I see... Some doodle grids, <laughs> so much color used. I don't know. It's just a, it's a waste of spray cans sometimes. It's fine. I but I like I like to keep it really simple. The other thing is also, I want to be able to have something on the wall that people uh, that brings people in uh, in a in a friendly mode. Uh, the doodle grids often confuse people and then they'll be like, well, I could have done this, <laughs> you know, so um, I really want to bridge right away, you know, with the neighbors and with the surroundings. And I've painted in so many different, you know, when I, when I painted uh, with, with Akut in um, uh, Yekaterinburg, uh, there was snow up to our hips, you know, it was in, in Russia in April and it, it, we painted in... I don't know, like just all these places where it wasn't meant, I mean, we didn't know if we would even be finishing this wall. So I kind of approach a wall like this. I start at some point where I know I can leave it and people can still make something of it, even if I fall off the ladder or there's a thunderstorm or something and I have to go home. So I don't want to just, I don't want to leave a lot of questions. And just imagine someone doing a doodle grid and then having to go to their, I don't know, whoever's funeral. It's a mess with the neighborhood. <laughs> so, oh God, I'm so dark again, mentioning funerals and stuff. That's okay. Sorry. That's okay. I think we're, we're all prepared for it. So we talked about um, this idea of you being hidden in graffiti. And now suddenly you are bang out there in the middle, spotlight on you. How, how does that feel? Are you kind of comfortable with that now? Because I know that this originally came from a place of trying to, you know, maybe create your own kind of protective shield around yourself. And this is the removal of all that shield, all that protection. Well, the, um, that's, that's, that's the thing. Once I took on that role of Hera, I was already in a different, um, in a costume, not a costume, but like um, an armor that made things way easier because I could be vulnerable at home and just um, get shit done uh, in the world. But um, that uh, now that I'm beyond 40, just I turned 41 in April. It's just kind of this thing where I think 
it's okay, you can call me either. You can call me both. It's fine. And now it's it's almost like a merge. So before it was really split and I kept things private, but now I'm so comfortable with being both Hera and Jasmine and um and I, I that's that's uh that's just what uh time does, I think. Do we see the identity of Hera disappearing completely and it becomes Jasmine Sadiq? Mm, I doubt it. I sometimes, you know, some galleries, well, yeah, they say, oh, <clears throat> you should, you should get rid of this graffiti thing. You should get rid of this. What's this with with the the? But it's an alter ego, and there is a reason for this. And I'm not gonna stop pointing out the roots that that made that build my self esteem. Really, you know, that's I owe so much to graffiti. I owe so much to the first um, uh, people who, the first uh, persons there to um, teach me the difference of a fat cap and, uh, uh, you know, a skinny cap and stuff. So if, without that and without their um, rebellious uh, constitution, like basically, I mean, they were, the, they were hardcore writers. The ones that got me interested, they were, they were writers. They never really transitioned into street art. Um, and they risked everything they they put everything on the line um, to make a mark in the city and um, to fight for expression in a very rendered environment. Um, so I owe them that, and that's why I wouldn't let go of the name Hera because that would just not be the full story. We've been talking for over an hour. Uh -oh. I feel like I could easily do another hour but i'm gonna leave it yeah. there just i now. do have some work to do you know i know i know that <laughs> honestly this is we'll call this part one part okay. two part two tvc thank you so much for your time well thank you dog Mwah. <laughs>